Hey guys, Evan and Miranda here. Welcome to my workshop. I wanted to thank all of you who stepped up when I was trying to track down a, uh, a <clears throat> excuse me, a BCM QRF handguard and help me find one. Uh, the cool story behind this is that within quite literally, I think six or seven hours of me posting that video that night, a gentleman from Cleveland, Tennessee, which is close to Chattanooga, um, said, yeah, I've, I've actually got one on an 11 and a half BCM that I've always wanted to swap out. So I brought him out an MCMR and um, swapped it out right there. For those of you who offered other solutions, I want to explain to you why it is that I choose the BCM product. Every handguard out there has a weak point, and the weak point is essentially the, the bridge, if you will, the, the top portion, the Picatinny. The top portion of the handguard where the gas tube goes through is the weak part of the handguard. And what ends up happening is every manufacturer out there has their clamping hardware down on the bottom. So what you end up with is the clamping hardware is here and it begins to clamp side to side and it essentially takes that weak part, the top part of the handguard, and as it drags the handguard down toward the clamping force, the weak part of the handguard is stretched down further and so now you've already made the weakest part of the handguard weaker by dragging it. Whereas the BCM product takes the weak part of the handguard and actually places the clamping hardware there. Because this is an unbroken circle, an unbroken ring if you will. And the break in the ring is up here at the bridge. Well, what they've done is there's the unbroken circle and the bridge is here. Well, that's where they put the clamping force. So now, at a certain level, it, it finishes off that ring and reinforces the ability of the handguard to do its job. Because the handguard's job is to be rigid, as rigid as possible. One of my viewers the other day said, oh yeah, those, those uh, BCM handguards are nothing but limp lasagna noodles. No, they're not. These are very, very stiff. If you respect my opinion, then you need to ask yourself the question, why does Abner choose BCM products? BCM does not send me stuff for free. The, you know, every once in a while they'll send me something for sample, but I'll flat out tell you guys what that is. For years now, I have bought stacks and stacks of handguards, and this right here only represents a portion of the amount of handguards that I purchased. These are all the wrenches that the handguards come with. Whenever I would build an AR-15 for someone, I would make sure to not send the wrench with it. Because this right here basically says, hey, you can take that upper part whenever you feel like it. You don't want to do that because that voids the warranty. So um, that ought to tell you guys how many uh, handguards I've built over the years. But anyways, let's build uh, a Mark 18 for you guys, and I'll show you um, how I do it. And you guys will, those of you who, who are either shade tree armors or even armors armors will say, oh, I don't do it that way. Guys, there are multiple ways to do things. I'm going to show you the way I do it. Let's go. There's a saying that goes, no one likes to see the sausage being made. Well, you guys are watching the sausage being made. I've been building guns for, man, for a long time. I think my, my first AR-15 build was in 2001, quite literally months after uh, September 11, 2001. And uh, the last, I don't know, well, basically ever since the reaction rod came out with it eight years ago, something like that. I've been using the reaction rod. I really like the way it works. I like how it does its job. And it, man, does it do it well. I have all the blocks for building ARs. Um, here are the upper blocks. I bought these years ago. I think I got them from Spikes Tactical. And then I've got the lower block. Um, but I have found that the tools from Geisley are so much better at their job. I actually have the lower, the lower receiver building block where you actually begin with the receiver extension and it slots in to the tool. But I, with all honesty, I tend to use the, the Delrin block that locks in here and just allows you to have the upper in a standing position. Okay, um, first things first, you inspect your barrel. Hold out to the light, take a look through it. Make sure the barrel's in good condition. Make sure there are no burrs on the M4 feed ramps. In all the years that I've been building with Ballistic Advantage barrels, I've had one 
one barrel that had marks on it. And that's really saying something because man have I built with a lot of barrels from that. And when you're putting it onto this, be careful because this can raise a burr there, so be very careful. Okay, let me show you real quick. This will not fit easily into the upper receiver. So how do you get around that? You apply heat. When I was a surgical assistant many years ago, I had a surgeon that taught me that in the operating room, you always want to have something playing in the background that you have memorized so that your mind can pay attention to that, kind of like a, like a fun thing to listen to, and so that you can watch something with your mind's eye. Usually I'll have a John Wayne movie going, but for the sake of this video I'm going to keep it quiet in here. I've lubed this up with extreme duty gun oil because I want to make sure that when I get this up to temperature that slides in with the least amount of resistance. And all you do is just rotate this over the flame. This is not going to hurt the anodizing in any way whatsoever. Keep it there just shy of a minute. And you'll notice it doesn't really take much to get this hot enough to seat that barrel. There, slides right in. In fact, it's, now it's already beginning to cool. So, once again, don't force. Just apply a little more heat. The last thing you want to be doing is applying stank on any of this stuff because you'll damage things. I've said this before, if you want to get into building guns, you're going to have to invest in certain tooling. But even the tooling can't really give you the knowledge that is needed to do things because you'll end up causing damage without knowing that you've caused damage. Okay, in fact, I'll show you one of the things that you may not know. The crown on this barrel is very precise. And if you're having difficulty seating, you would want to take a rubber mallet or a dead blow hammer like this and whack it. But here's the deal. You don't want to risk damaging that crown. So the way you get around that is you take your A2 flash hider or A flash hider. I don't really care what it is. And you basically screw it on until it bottoms out because even without a washer it will bottom out. Now if you needed to you could put this onto a hard surface and you could just whack, whack, whack and you can wail on it to really get it to seat in there. But I don't have to because I felt it bottom out under heat. It went tick and it stopped. So now you can take this off or, or you can keep it on or you can do this. Take this little doodad right here and it goes over the end of the barrel and it's a rubber cap. It protects the threads and the crown from any potential damage. When you're putting this onto the reaction rod, be very careful as you center it on so that you're not causing any potential damage. Once it's on, you can begin the process of getting the ejection port cover on. When you empty out a bag, make sure you hold the bag up to the light. This is a Luth AR kit that I'm using. I buy these from RSR but you want to hold it up to the light and make sure that there's nothing left in the bag before you throw this bag away. Have I mentioned how much I dislike doing this step? I take a small Allen key and I thread it through one side. I take this fella and I thread it through on this side. Begin to introduce it. And actually, with, for this step, take your gloves off because you run the risk of damaging the gloves and then you're just pitching gloves left and right. Take the spring, preload it, seat one side, run that bad boy through there, seat the other, push, boom, done, seated. You'd be surprised how many of these I've done that don't fit that well. And then to help it seat in properly, a little oil there, a little oil there, your first couple are going to be really stiff. The reaction rod will open it for you in the same manner that the detent on a uh, bolt carrier group will open it. Next, lube up the threads on the upper. Oh, by the way, guys, this is a uh, an upper receiver from Aero Precision. Um, Aero Precision, y'all really dropped the ball on centralizing your laser markings 
doesn't really bug me all that much. But uh, some people are not as forgiving as I am about this kind of thing. But yeah, um, they need to do a better job of centering that. What you do is you apply Lucas Extreme Duty Gun Oil. I started buying this years ago when I realized that uh, when Lucas had gotten into the, uh, into the gun lube industry, I went, oh, yeah, I'm in. Why? Because Lucas is a lube company. They know what they're doing when it comes to lubrication. All right, once this is seated, before you go on to completing your upper receiver, you want to get your barrel nut in place, and I'll show you guys why in a little bit. But the first thing that has to happen is gas block has to come off. All you got to do is give it one rotation. Oop. And hanging onto the barrel, not onto the upper, because if you hang onto the upper, it could back the barrel out. Hang onto the barrel. Give it a little rotation and pull off. Clean those metal shavings off while you're there from the drilling process. Take a microfiber, pass it through the gas block just to make sure that you're getting any potential filings that are there from the drilling process. Okay, that's out of the way. Rotate that back. Take your barrel nut. All right, guys, between this edit and the last edit, it's been 24 hours. I had a, I had a chuckle fest when I went looking for the barrel nut and, like, completely drew a blank and had a partial panic attack when I couldn't find it because I had forgotten that with me swapping out the previous handguard for the, for the, um, for the QRF, I had... Um, I had sacrificed the handguard that was on this upper receiver, this 11.3. I had taken the, uh, the M-Lock, which is an MCMR, off of this, and I'd swapped it out for this, for Stuart, the gentleman that allowed me to have that, and I needed to order the replacement handguard for this, so that just came in yesterday, and uh, that's actually going to get swapped out today, so I'm going to lay that over there. And so anyways, the new handguard came in, and it is here. And actually, you know what? While I have the two handguards off, let me show you guys really quick. The difference in weight is absolutely, yes, it is, it is considerable. When you're talking uh, QRF versus MCMR, QRF is 9.8 ounces. And, um, I'm sorry, not MCMR, um, this is KMR. Uh, KMR is 6.2 ounces, and the MCMR version of this, which is the M-Lock version of this, actually weighs a little bit he a little bit more because there's more air. There's more air in the KMR handguard <laughs> than aluminum. The MCMR handguard has far more um, solid areas to it than the KMR does, but yeah. There's a disparity of weight between going full Picatinny versus going slick down handguard. But the reason that I'm choosing this for the Mark 18 build is this is visually correct to the layout of the Mark 18. And also, this is going to be far more rigid than this is only because there's a lot more meat here to work with. And ultimately, I'm not trying to build a lightweight rifle in this, in this uh, Mark 18. I'm trying to build a very stiff rifle. All right, let's get to it.
right, the next thing that needs to happen is I need to get the, um, the barrel nut in place. And first thing I do is I separate the, um, separate the, the, the mounting tool for the handguard. And I put it in that box that I showed you guys yesterday. Now this is a crucial thing when you do this part next. Barrel nut. Take, uh, take the uh, thread locker and the Allen key or Allen wrench and separate them from everything else. Come on out of there, come on. And I have a considerably large collection of these little guys because like I said, I've done like a bazillion hand guards over the years. So I've got a lot of those pieces. And then this and this go with the KMR that I just showed you because I already have these two pieces that were part of the QRF. So these two will go with this handguard to be mounted later on. But this is what I was waiting for. And like I said uh, previously in the video, before you throw away a bag, hold it up to the light and verify that there's nothing left in it before you pitch the thing. Cutie mount and Picatinny rail segment for the KMR handguard goes down here. Whenever you're working guys, try to keep your parts together so that you don't go um, looking for stuff later going, hey, where'd such and such go? Okay, uh, like I did yesterday, that's already been installed. And now the barrel nut goes in place. And when you're screwing this on guys, make sure that the barrel manufacturer that you're working with has produced a barrel that has been properly made because one time and one time only I was working with I can't remember who the barrel manufacturer was it wasn't ballistic but the alignment key the tab whatever this thing is called was slightly proud of the threads and as the barrel nut tried to go in I kept hearing crunch, 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 and I stopped and realized that I needed to file that down. See how, listen, listen to how smooth that is. Hear that? That's what you want. You want nice, smooth travel, which is why this whole thing got lubed big time. And because there's a protective, uh, sort of a, a greasy type coating that's on these pieces, you want to kind of smooth that out and work that in before you get going. Now for this part, all I'm doing is applying just enough force to move that barrel nut and then loosen. It's going to shock you guys. It's going to shock you guys how little equates to 50 foot-pounds. This is put on with 50 foot-pounds and I've got a torque wrench that I'm going to use. But right now I'm using a, uh, just a wrench that I got from Spikes Tactical years ago, which is actually um, the castle nut wrench. But because these were designed to work with the same tool that puts on a castle ring um, on an AR-15, it works really well. I also like this because it allows you to put on controlled pressure without raising burrs. Because if you raise burrs on the barrel nut, then when the handguard goes over, it'll scratch the inside of the handguard. It'll actually gouge the inside of the handguard. And it'll technically make for a for a looser lockup. You don't want that. And because this one came off of a factory upper, I know that I'm good on the build. So you just basically pour on just enough stink to get the thing a little bit on the tight side. And you're doing this a total of four or five times. Each and every time I do this, I'm engaging the threads. If you're wondering why I'm doing this, I'm engaging the threads and I'm stretching the upper receiver. I'm stretching the threads on the upper receiver, rather. All right, now the last one is done with the torque wrench set at 50 foot-pounds. And for those that don't know, torque wrenches are used like this, not like this. Make sure the wrench is good and solid. And rotate. And that's it. Which I know that for some of you, when you when you do this, it'll actually shock you just how little 
uh, is actually 50 foot pounds. I mean, it, it yeah, it always it always shocks me how little torque actually equates to 50 foot pounds because you've got a really long load arm on this thing. Very recently, I had a a previous customer come in to have some um, some work done on his uh, upper receiver. I needed to swap his upper out for another one. And I was so grateful that I built with torque wrenches because I was able to get the thing apart without busting a gut. All right, for this part, we got a little bit on the old school side. A piece of engineered flooring as a spacer. And then the spring goes in. This is for the, uh, for the forward assist. And the key when you're doing this is make sure that the, the claw, the paw, some people call it, is hooked like this and not like that. You want this thing aligned, you want this aligned this way and not that way. The piece of wood creates just enough resistance. Push this against the back wall, take the barrel protector off, and I put in its place, come on. I put in its place a microfiber towel so that I can push against it without it bruising me in the belly. You do this about seven or eight times a day, you end up getting bruised. What I do is I push in and I'm loading this right here. I'm loading the spring in. That allows me to take the pin, lube it up just a little bit with oil, place it, and then I take a stare at punch, place the punch on top. Make sure it's starting nice and straight. It's crucial that you're pinching that pin. I'm sorry, it's crucial that you're pinching the punch against that pin so that it doesn't skip off and mar the upper receiver. And it gets pretty slick because it's all it's all oiled up. When you get close, go to a brass rod, and it'll keep you from I'm permanently digging anything up. Not to mention the brass rod does a nice job of, of imparting a fair amount of mass to really get that thing to just seat. And whenever brass makes contact with it, it doesn't hurt anything, it just wipes away easily. Brass rods, guys, invest in them. That last little bit, go to a smaller diameter punch. I'll do my gas tube one. You want this flush if you can get it. There we go. Now it's flush. And it's seated properly. And the way you test this is you take a bolt carrier group and you insert the bolt carrier group Search bolt carrier group. And you better have free play. Because something that happened to me recently is, I'll see if I can simulate it for you. That, that sound. Alright, listen, listen. You hear that? Now watch. It doesn't back out, does it? What had happened was, the paw on the Ford Assist that I purchased, and I'm going to keep the company's name out of it out of respect because I'm going to trust that they fixed the, the issue because I brought it to their attention. The, the paw on theirs was out of spec, and when I was inserting it, I heard that as I slid it in. I was like, no, I'm in trouble, and then I had to back the pin all the way out and pull the part all the way out just to get this out because what ends up happening is if this is out of spec, as it rolls up home, it's locked in. It's not coming out. So, that's how you function check these. A little bit of oil on the inside. A little bit of oil around it. Happiness! Moving on. Alright, that's torqued. That's installed. That's installed. Gas block is going on next. This is the OEM gas block from Ballistic Advantage. It's already been cross-drilled with an exact corresponding notch in the barrel. And the way this goes in, insert it, 
And because they've already cross drilled it, they've already done the relief, the standoff. There's a bit of standoff that has to happen right here. They've already done that for you. So what you're doing when you're connecting this is you take one screw out. Hang on, let me move that camera. All right, you take out one screw. And there should be a little ghost image. You're going to see a little ghost image here and here where the screws were previously touching. You're looking for those ghost images through the screw hole. Now, I'm not going to Loctite this right now. I'm going to Loctite this once I've got everything in place. And I'll show you guys what I mean by Loctite. The initial screws go in. Not, not like heavy duty tight, just, just finger-ish tight. Or not even, I'm sorry, not even finger tight. Basically just the slightest little flick. And I'll show you why in just a second. Okay. Well, I think I actually got it right off the bat. What you're looking for is looking through that hole and you're basically looking for the play of light across the two surfaces. The two surfaces are the gas block and the barrel. The bit has been passed through to drill this out and you're looking for the play of light to make sure that it's even as it passes through there. And that honestly looks pretty darn good. So now what I do is I put a decent amount of stank on this, no Loctite yet, okay? And really guys, you don't even have to Loctite. The only reason I do is um, the, uh, the initial break-in period for your gun, there is the potential that your screws could turn loose and someone's going to go, yeah, but that's, isn't that the whole point of the pin? Yeah, that is the whole point of the pin, but the pin doesn't keep the intimate lockup that is needed to keep gas from escaping, which is a crucial part of the break-in period for a rifle. All right, take your pin, place your pin, and when I do this, I lift the barrel so that when I hit here, the force is only going here instead of this being on a solid surface and the barrel taking the impact and slowly being bent that way. The initial wax, can be done boldly here. And once you get this far, then you can get out your brass rod and actually I should show you guys the other ones. I've got the long one. This is used for when you're trying to take gas blocks and just beat the stuffing, uh, beat them to get them off of a barrel, which is what I had to do last week for, uh, for my buddy Zach. And then I've got these other two. And this one, basically just hold it like this and allows you to really put a lot of impact on this without risking damaging the, the, the gas block or the barrel. And now what you're looking for is symmetry of that pin. And you see, see how quick that happened. That did not take long at all. And that's, that's close. We'll go back the other way. Make it purdy. Yeah, there you go. So, you're just after a visual symmetry. Now, someone's going to be like, yeah, well, you never see this through the handguard. Yeah, but you know what? You know it's there. And you know that beauty has happened because you've actually put the time in. Yeah, I just said beauty and I mixed it in with the word rifle. Shut up. The next part is the gas tube. When you're doing the gas tube, make sure you put this end in your mouth and you blow through the gas tube to make sure that if there's, if there's anything in here, it presents itself here. Also, if you shake back and forth, if there is something in the gas tube, you'll hear it. And sometimes things do end up in gas tubes, little metal filings and whatnot. So basically, you would put this in your mouth, you blow, do not inhale, don't suck. Uh, you'll Tell you what, do it one time and you'll know why. You'll go, oh, that's an interesting flavor. So anyways, this goes into this end. And you put a little bit of lube on it. Introduce it to your upper receiver. And obviously when you're doing this, you make sure you actually have the right gas tube. And that really should have happened from the get-go when you ordered the thing. Once you seat the thing, here's a little tip. To know that you have the correct one, 
if you look inside the upper receiver, you're basically looking for the gas tube to be at the very back end of this half moon cutout. And this half moon cutout is for the cam for your bolt carrier group for this part right here. That's what that, that corner is all about, that bulge. It's that area right there. And your gas tube on any given size, on any given size of barrel, gas tube, upper receiver combination, your gas tube should never exceed that line right there. Okay, when you're doing this right here, and I'm going to take the camera off and I'm going to hold it up here so you guys can have a good look at it. We have a high contrast surface in the background. I'll see if I can get through the... there. Watch through this little hole right here. So you see, you see yellow, and then you see yellow again, about right there. I don't know if that helped you guys see or not, but basically what you're looking for is that little bit of light between there's a the front, I push it back, I bottom out, I realize I now have to back up just a touch. And when I back it up just a touch, I then take one of my, there it is, one of my small pin or punches, and I push it through. Yep, so we know because that's moving that that sucker is dead center. Trust me guys, you think this is small potatoes, you do this wrong one time and send it out to a customer, you're never living that down. So once that's aligned, actually we'll just leave that in there for a second. Once that's aligned, I then take my, I've got a slave punch, and I take the pin, and I insert it as best I can. And if it doesn't want to insert, actually I don't like that pin. Let's use a different pin. Let's use a different pin. There we go. That one's got a rounded edge. Actually, you know what? I'll show that to you guys. If your pin doesn't have the rounded edge that you're looking for. All right, by whacking it on a wooden surface back here, I have seated this pin inside of the slave punch. I then take 220, 220 grit sandpaper, and I'm running, I'm doing this motion while dragging. What I'm doing is I'm creating a nice beveled edge on this pin. Years ago, your gas block pins were beautiful. They were nicely beveled, they were smooth as silk, and in recent years what we've ended up with is a bunch of crap parts in the industry. And now check that out. See the beveled edge on it? See how nice that looks? And what that's going to do is it's going to funnel, funnel it in like this and drive it in nice and clean through that hole. Now what I do is I just take, introduce a little bit of oil on the pin, introduce a little bit of oil on the gas block, place this, lift up, because once again we do not want to impart impact on this barrel. Now you're going to listen for this making contact with this. Hear that? Dick, 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 like that, and now you know that it's it's made contact one time. Now you stop. Now you take your brass and always make sure that you're seated on the reaction rod because it will advance off. So make sure you're seated on the reaction rod. Lift again. Place the brass. And it's pretty flush. The uh, Geisley pin set or the, the gas block pin starting set is are these three pieces here. Slave punch and then uh, starter and then finisher. Place your finisher. With this one you can get you can usually get away with one whack without any risk to your barrel. And that's it. Slightest little bit of you want to just slightly concave. You obviously don't want to be able to feel it on that side because if you feel it on that side, well, guess what you're doing? You're backing it up. But yeah, that's, that's a done deal. And now what you're doing is you're looking, actually, listen. It needs to go that way, just a skosh. So now what I do, and now what I'm looking for is there should be equal light on this area right here. 
and this side it's contacting and this side it's loose which means I got to go that way so what I do is because the screws are loose the pin is in place you can move that gas block and you'll be surprised at how fast you can actually that's actually better already you should be able to hear tick 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 when you go either side and I need it to move over just a bit more not only are you looking for visual symmetry when you're doing this kind of thing you're also you're also looking and listening for mechanical symmetry and what, I, what you guys can't tell from off camera I'm using the play of natural light that's coming in from the window over there and I'm allowing the natural light to play across this surface right here and I'm looking straight down the gas block the gas tube all the way into the upper receiver and I'm looking for symmetry See, that's a lot better than it was when I first started. This normally takes a few wax. In fact, shame on me, I should have put this up. The metal hammer goes back on the pegboard so that you don't accidentally grab that. Get the big guns out now. The dead blow mallet. That'll move stuff. That. You hear that? That's what you're after. Yeah, that's it right there. Yep. That's happy place right there. That loose wobble sound you hear? That's what you're after. Because what you don't want is this like a like a piano string. You got you want it wobbling back and forth. Because remember guys, it has to line up with the gas key. And there has to be there has to be just enough play to it for it to freely line up. That's the sound of happiness right there. All right now, the screws can get a little bit of Loctite on them. What I'm going to show you now is essentially known as blind loading. What you do is you fill the hole with Loctite, introduce the screw, turn this thing, you just put a little bit of stank on it, not much. You don't want to split that screw. And yes, you can split one of these screws. And if you split a screw inside of a gas block, you are in major trouble. And you're going to need something like this bad boy to get it out. Reverse bit or whatever they call those things. They're designed for pulling out bad screws. You can tell I've got everything laid out for doing this kind of thing. Because every once in a while you do a real miscalculation on something. Or you end up with bad parts that just don't play nice together. Which, by the way, guys, that's why it's worth spending money on good parts. All right, oh, actually, this is perfect. Let me show it to you, ha, 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 ha. This is textbook, watch. The Loctite went here and here, but look where it came out. Came out of that pin, and check right here. Look at that, see that Loctite? It's oozing out around the gas block. Even on the front, it's oozing out around the gas block. And that's what you're after. <clears throat> that Loctite should ooze out. What you've now done is you've hydraulically pressed Loctite. You've blind loaded it and hydraulically pressed it. And it's just oozing out around the edges of the gas block. And that's what you want. Within 30 minutes, this thing will be completely seized up. There is no way. Let me put it this way. Within 30 minutes, this gas block is darn near permanently attached to this barrel. To such a degree that I could take these screws out knock out the pin and this gas block would never move. And remember guys, Loctite's job is there to inhibit the free wheel spinning of screws or the, or the casual migration of pins. It's not there for brute force. And there isn't brute force. And someone's going to say, well, y'all, there are tens of thousands of pounds of energy. Yeah, blah, blah, blah. But those are running up through the gas, uh, through the gas porthole in the, in the barrel and up through the gas tube. Those are not, those are not um, shearing forces or torquing forces. Those are just explosive forces that are going up, over, and back. So I'm telling you this from experience. What I've just done here is darn near permanent. And to such a degree that whenever I have to take uh, weapons apart that I've built, there is blow torching and there is cursing that in, that's involved. It is a good two minutes 
of rotating heat over a blowtorch on this area here just to get the screws to come out then to get the pin to come out then then if I'm lucky I can get this out and actually separate the gas tube but that normally requires um, uh, lubricating with Ed's Red or Mongoose Lube which is essentially a transmission based lubricant a transmission fluid based lubricant and then getting that pin to come out and maybe if you're lucky getting this to come out if not you're taking this brass rod and you can see how scarred up this brass rod is right and uh, those marks and those marks and essentially you'd put something to protect the crown of your barrel you place it on a hard surface in fact you can see little rings on this on this workbench this is placed at an angle you create a spacer effect with your hand like this so that you're not accidentally hitting here and you have a friend holding the upper receiver and you are wailing on this thing with a dead blow mallet trying to get that gas block to get the crap off and when I hear people say oh well you know Loctite can't take heat dude that's about as intimately close to heat as you can possibly get and yet I'm telling you from experience you have to pound to get that thing to come off so anybody that tells you that Loctite can't take the heat is clearly reading off of uh, the, the interwebs okay so when you're doing this everything is a series of checks what have I done I've done this I've done this that's torqued this is seated that's nice and centered where I want it that pin is in these screws are in they're properly torqued and the cross pin is in place so now the muzzle device goes on and I'm just going to do an A2 flash hider with a uh, with a crush washer and the crush washers that I use are ATI trust me guys quality matters because if you end up with crush washers oh yeah I got them really cheap yeah well really cheap crush washers don't properly align and they don't properly seat and what you end up with is a nightmare trying to get everything to find its happy place the beveled edge goes toward the shoulder take the flash hider also lube it up once again all I'm using is Lucas Extreme Duty Gun Oil this goes on to hand tight right there and you take this little fella that I bought years ago couldn't tell you who makes it couldn't tell you where I got it from because I frankly don't remember and it fits inside and normally you can just put like a, a socket on it but I just put a wrench on it and now you just start turning dude that never happens I think I'm actually going to be able to yeah crush washer should be able to give you a full 360 rotation and a little bit more I'm not going to need it because here's the bottom flat of the A2 flash hider all I've got to do is get that centered here and I'm done so I'll go about right there rotate to the top and these are the two angles that I now have to bring here and center up this right here has to be center aligned with this and as I'm doing this I'm looking for the play of light across these surfaces and now what I do is clean, clean my workbench off briefly by the way guys Loctite it ends up everywhere but as long as you're wiping it off with a oiled um, uh, microfiber cloth you're never gonna have to worry about that Loctite really doing much of anything in, in the way of binding any particular work surface to itself See, I've been sidetracked while filming this for you guys because generally when I'm doing this every step means that the previous uh, the previous step is finished and all the pieces go back to where they belong on the board now what I do is I take this and I back it against the wall and as I'm doing this I'm lifting and I'm putting the play of light right across these this 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 and this all these surfaces and I'm looking for the symmetry of light going right down the middle now, now check it out guys this is the crucial part the symmetry you're after isn't so much this cut to this line because remember gas blocks aren't always going to end up dead center this and this are what you're lining up specifically the hole that the gas tube passes through because this is a, a line of symmetry 
that is hard and fast. It should never move because uh, uh, imagine that this is the ground and this is the tower built on the ground. So this is the base plate that's on the ground. You want the top of the tower aligned for symmetry's sake to that, to this cut out right here. So what I'm after is the play of even line or even light between here and here. Not here, not here. Although initially it's this, this, this to this. But in the final analysis it's this to that and only this to that. And this of course guys is when you're dealing with with muzzle devices that have crush washers for timing purposes. You can also take it off and look at it this way. And that is, honestly, man, that's, that's about center. It really is. If anything, I'd say it's just a skosh past. And the nice thing about a quality crush washer is, if you've gone a skosh past, you can always back it up just a fuzz and not really run the risk of hurting anything. And all this is, is you're placing it here and you're just leaning into it. It's ever so slightly imperceptible, but you can feel the slight little bit of motion. This is one of the reasons that I've had to choose to get out of building uppers because it takes so long to get these things just right. And like I, like I said recently in a video, a review video, of a weapon that I got, they didn't time the, uh, the A2 flash header correctly. They got it just so, called it a day and moved on. Okay, we are reaching the home stretch. Before you move on, you make sure that there is symmetry between the barrel, the crush washer, and the A2 flash hider, or whatever your muzzle device is. And that the crush washer has self-centered, which it has. So this is one time where being self-centered is a good thing and that everything is pretty. Someone's gonna probably end up saying, oh, you know what, you need to put chapters on this video. Nope, I'm not going to, and here's why. If I'm going through the effort of doing all this work to show this stuff to you guys, the last thing I need to do is to make it easy for somebody to skip over something and go to what they think they're looking for. Everything of what I'm doing is tied to everything else. All right, the next thing you do is you lube. Now you lube the barrel nut liberally with oil on both of these surfaces take the spacer or lock device or whatever the crap this thing is called slide it in place make sure it's centered then, lube the inside lumen of the handguard itself. And the good thing about this Lucas Extreme Duty Gun Oil is, it has a really high flash point. So when it begins to smoke, you know you're pretty much there. Give your barrel one last little cosmetic wipe down, because this is the last time you're going to see this barrel for years to come. Unless you're like I am and I take things apart every once in a while and look. All right, I'm gonna tell you right now, don't do this. Don't do what I'm about to do. <laughs> I have to say that, so if one of you guys ruin something, you don't get to say that I'm the one that told you to do it. Don't do what I'm doing. Because the paperwork on these handguards tells you do not use open flame, don't use a blowtorch. Well, I'm here to tell you that I use a blowtorch because I want this handguard expanded as big as I can get it. Especially these QRFs, these things are monsters. They're huge. And they, the, the Picatinny rails act like heat sinks and they suck up and disperse so much energy, just like the fins on a radiator or on a, on a, um, uh, what is it? Like the air cold engines where they just have heat sinks built in or like transmissions where they have heat sinks built into the transmission. And what I'm doing is I'm just pouring on a, a lot of heat. I don't mean a little bit, I mean a lot of heat is getting poured onto this handguard. And I'm trying to keep the flame from going inside. I keep the flame from going inside as much as I can because I'm not trying to eat up that oil with direct flame. I'm trying to heat the entire handguard. 
and this area right here where my hand is should begin to get uncomfortably hot and once it gets there then I know that this thing is ready to go on should have shown you this before I did this to show you how tight the fit is by doing this it really expands it how cool is that anyone who's ever built guns right now said bruh I'm doing that because what I have now done is I've taken so much abuse out of this now I can finish heating it to get it to seat the rest of the way all right you take the upper receiver you place on a hard surface to make sure that the Ford, whoa, that the Ford assist is over the edge you gotta work quick because a this is hot and b it's cooling down quickly and I'm seating this and that's pretty much it right there and then what you're looking for is between those inside of those holes right there you're looking to be able to see equal light passing through those holes if it's too far back you'll see the barrel nut which means the handguard has to go that way just to skosh which it does so now what you do is you hold the handguard and remember this sucker is hot all the way up to here now and you wail right on the muzzle device with a dead blow mallet and you create just that little bit of, ooh, that's hot. You create just that little bit of gap right there. And what you're after is the ability of the hardware. Remember, guys, every time on and off this reaction rod, it is a gentle, straight on, straight off motion. What you're looking for here is to make sure that your hardware passes cleanly through those surfaces. Alright, so number one goes in. By the way, this does not need locked up. Number one goes in. Number two goes in on the other side. And it should be with the minimal amount of effort to get that to get that to pass through. And if you're having to put more effort than that, then you need to back off some. Yeah, that should have done it. Yeah, that did it. Okay, now, this is why I say to you guys, no one ever likes to watch the sausage being made. So now, what I'm doing is, I'm just creating just hand tight right there. I stop there and I introduce this screw make sure that these surfaces are flat because these pieces tend to want to buck up on you so make sure that they're lying flat make sure they're lying flat make sure that this screw has engaged the threads ever so slightly on this side now reseat everything there and now I've re-narrowed that gap I had made a conservative I had made a considerable gap there just a moment ago, so now I've re-narrowed that gap just a little bit. And now what I'm doing, and by the way, this is amazing, because these act like heat sinks, this, this is already to the point where I can actually touch it. So now what I'm doing is, with both index fingers, I'm feeling for symmetry on either side of this. Handguard, upper, need to have symmetry right here. What I'm feeling for is that both edges are are even with one another and I'm blown away how beautifully that's coming together because generally speaking there's whacking going going on so if you have to move one or the other um, you can strike here to move the to move the handguard over or you can strike here but be mindful of this little guy right here this little bit of ribbing if you hit that, you will crack that off. Those surfaces are nice and neat. Now, the other thing that you're doing is, uh, imagine that this is the horizon, and you're watching the sun setting and rising along that tiny little horizon. And if this is not centered up with the other, what you get, instead of having a nice clean line where the light plays across that seam, if they're like this with one another, you know, if they're not, if they're not lined up, what you get when you, when you pass the light like that, you get this weird uneven horizon effect and it allows you to see that one or the other is out of alignment with the other why is this so crucial someone's asking right about now is because if the handguard is not aligned remember this is the ground this is the base of the tower that you've been assembling 
if if this is not in proper alignment with this when you put your your uh, front sight on wind digit and elevation are going to be off so instead of elevation being up and down and windage being left and right now elevation basically becomes elevation is no longer up and down now elevation is slightly off same with windage windage is no longer left and right now windage is basically a diagonal down or a diagonal up this right here is the moment where if that upper is not built correctly you're setting yourself up for years of frustration when you're trying to zero the upper here's another key thing to remember if you can't put this to your chin without it hurting, then it's still too hot. You want this to be the, to the point where you can touch it to your face, you can touch it with your hands, and then this is cool enough. If you're dealing with a normal handguard, on um, the, the thin handguards, if you're dealing with these types of handguards, you may have to spray them down with alcohol. So all you do is you spritz everything with alcohol and rotate it while blowing on it and it dissipates that heat quickly and as long as you can touch it to your face you're good to go so now the symmetry is there so now we can put the proper torque on this the next thing that I'm going to show you is a tool that if you don't have and if you're intending on building you're going to need this because guys you do not want to be guessing when you're doing this type of work Okay? guessing has no place when you're building a precision instrument and AR-15s, modern day AR-15s are precision instruments. Alright, I've got a fat wrench, firearm accurizing torque wrench. Had this thing forever, in fact you can see right here where when I first started building years ago and I had to remember all the torque specs, KMR 30 to 40 inch pounds. Now what I do is I set it to 30 and I always leave it at 30 and what I do is I put the handguard on and the first one that gets tightened is the sprocket end. And put it on and you rotate till it clicks. And now I know that I've got to I've got to go further and where this has ended up, I frankly don't like. I really don't like that right there. I'm going to make sure that these surfaces are lubricated properly since this is old hardware it might have no nope. yeah I want to make sure that that has enough oil on it or as we say here in Tennessee oil to do its job properly to slide when you're doing this guys make sure you're supporting the tool or well when this gets introduced you have to support it once that's locked in, push on the other side, push this against your belly and rotate. You want to make sure that there is enough oil on every surface so that everything is sliding off of everything else. Because lubrication makes assembly so much easier. Remember that back screw doesn't go all the way in just yet. You just want it to go in deep enough to grab the inside edge of this piece here. Place it, verify your torque wrench, 30 inch pounds, click it, and once you click the thing you pretty much have committed, you're going to have to go slightly past where it stopped. And now I don't even have to bother taking this thing to 40 inch pounds because I already know I'm there. I know I'm there and then some. And uh, you know it is what it is because you have to find the next spot on that sprocket where the screw on the back side can pass all the way through. So once that thing clicks at 30 inch pounds, it is what it is. And I gotta go, I gotta move forward. Remember guys, everything in the world of engineering has um, has a bit of forgiveness written into it and I'm telling you from experience I've never ever split a handguard and I've had some handguards that were such boogers and as I was doing this I was applying rotational force but very gently feeling for any kind of metal scraping because if if these surfaces right here 
if this screw doesn't move past the sprockets on the head of that screw, then what ends up happening is it makes contact with one of those and it'll chew it right off. I did that one time. I wasn't paying attention and I was tightening and and I was like, oh yay, well there goes more money. Once that's in, you can put the torque wrench on. And remember guys, we've already exceeded the 30 and we've probably already exceeded 40, but we're gonna go ahead and click it until it clicks at 30. And then you give it an extra little, what I refer to as a which is that right there. And then once again, check this. If this has moved any, guess what you get to do? That's right, the whole thing has to come apart and you gotta redo it. It's not that big a deal, really. It happens every once in a while. Luckily, not very often. But every once in a while, it will happen. Clean off all the oil so that you have a nice, clean play of light across the surfaces and check to make sure that all the hardware is seated correctly. All right, now that upper is actually done. You are now looking at what I refer to as the Tier 1 Citizen Mark 18. And once again, check the symmetry of the flash hider. And this now, now that this has been properly aligned to this, now your hard point is here. It's no longer here. You can now start treating this as the base because this has been properly aligned to this. So now the visual symmetry line has to be between here and here. And right now I'm using the light from over there. And I'm basically squinting off one eye and going dead center. And I'm also using the three right there on T36. I'm using this right here as the center line to visually align to with the, with the center port on my A2 flash hider. And those two lines are pretty darn good on. Yeah, buddy. Every time somebody asks me, why can't I put a suppressor on your Mark 18? Well, that's why. There's the A2 flash hider. But in reality, that's where it's screwed on to the barrel, right there. So your can can't reach the shoulder of the barrel because the A2 flash hider is just poking right past the leading edge of the handguard. It is what it is to get this kind of deliciousness. That's what you have to give up. But I have no intentions of putting a can on this gun. If I wanted to put a can on this gun, I would move this handguard to an 11.3, screw the can on, and then it would actually look like a Mark 18 suppressed. And with all honesty, most people wouldn't even be able to tell the difference. Okay, now let's start dressing this thing. Let's pull the holes away, and we'll get this thing properly dressed out. Come on! 